Namaste everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Bharat Varta podcast. We have a very special guest today. Uh, Sridhar Vembu is the co-founder and CEO of Zoho, which is one of the best known Indian software product companies. Uh, he's also an original thinker and his thoughts are extremely popular on social media. Uh, so without further ado, welcome, sir. Thank you so much uh, for making the time to be here. So, right, sir, uh, the theme of the podcast is on building uh, indigenous uh, capabilities uh, in India, right? And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I am a fan of your uh, Twitter threads, uh, which are just fascinating insights into, you know, how you think about some of these things. Uh, and today, you know, we will delve into some of the nuances of that. Hopefully, you'll be able to expand on, you know, some of the Twitter threads as such. Um, so let me take a step back and ask a very fundamental question in terms of uh, building these indigenous capabilities itself. Uh, I'm sure we cannot live in isolation, even though, you know, I mean, it's a, uh, uh, the, the concept of a globalized world is sort of, uh, 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 I would say, I mean, that, that concept itself is under attack at this point of time with localism and so on. Uh, my fundamental question is what do we borrow from the world and what do we build ourselves? How do we decide something like this? That's a good one. And I actually have a, a philosophy that I've called transnational localism. So it is localism, but there is a transnational component to it. And uh, in fact, we can think in series of concentric circles, right? starting with a household unit, to a community, to a, uh, maybe a district, to a state level in India, to a country, of course, and then the world. Um, we clearly will have a series of dependencies. Bo, man is an island, as the saying goes. So you are going to have dependency, absolutely. But the question is, where should something dependency be? It comes to food, it's obvious that food must be reasonably local. Okay, except maybe some luxury treats, right? But for everyday food, there must be local capability because, well, you know, it's, it's food security. And countries actually do enact policies for food security. And then I would extend it to say all many kinds of household basic goods should be local. And that's also employment. Right? And uh, this actually even take the most advanced you know, places in the world, like Silicon Valley, Bay Area, San Francisco, Bay Area. There's quite a lot of people who are not in the tech industry. In fact, the majority of the population is not in tech. And uh, many of them could be stuck in low wage occupations. And that's because there is not enough local production of certain kinds of goods. And, and of course, the real estate prices are expensive, all of that. But if you draw a concentric circle, and I'm taking the Bay Area as an example because this one extreme, and I'll come to my village here, the other extreme, so to speak. So I'm aware of these two extremes here. This is a highly technologically advanced uh, location. Still, if you go about 70, 80 miles, and you will get to Stockton. And Stockton from San Francisco is only about 70, 80 miles, and it will feel like a different world. Mm the local economic geography, the jobs, uh, the crisis of uh, even uh, drugs, a lot of that, Stockton feels like a different world altogether. So it's very clear that San Francisco's own prosperity is not even touching Stockton, mm. which is almost in the same area. Some people even do this two-hour commutes from Stockton into Silicon Valley, which is a really hard commute, but people do it. So that clearly says that you know, the prosperity has to spread. Otherwise, there's going to be social unrest. The inequality is not taking us anywhere. Right. Now, let's take the mirror image, the other side of the world. This particular rural area I'm in and the district itself, this is a highly rural district, actually. Even though Tamil Nadu is uh, one of the more urbanized states of India, this particular district is highly rural, Tenkasi district. And the majority the good majority, 60-70% of the population is rural, like in village panchayats, like the one I'm in. And the primary problem here is the lack of know-how and skills to be able to satisfy our own needs. And that manifests itself in the jobs crisis. There are no jobs for a lot of young people. 
and then there are there is debt pervasive debt because you still have consumption going on without jobs people buy motorcycles people buy smartphones and you know how that is financed it's often a yeah. monthly installment plan and the government is required to send in transfer payments in variety of ways the mandrega scheme for job creation is one and then outright grants like for example building toilets building uh, or gas stove a lot of these plans and i'm happy to say that these actually schemes do reach the villages hmm. the villagers for example day before yesterday one person showed their one roof extension and said this is from the central government paid for this so the new scheme they actually you know the, the scheme reach but we cannot run an economy on these transfer payments sure we have to have local local job creation and local income generation and to me that the ideal way to do it is think in circles of what goods are essential basic and what we can make and then go up in the chain and this is where i i this transnational part comes in where what is global has to be knowledge because if a new something is discovered mm. now it's instantaneously transmitted everywhere mm. there's no real gap between you know there is no gap between san francisco and here mm. i'm actually accessing the same technologies that is available in san francisco for work and we are on this call right now in a meeting and uh, this is transnational so knowledge does spread but production has to be local for an increasing variety of goods that are now you know the simpler goods first and then more complex as the income levels go up and the more complex goods expand outward that means maybe not at a village level but at a district level because the district here is about 1 and 1/2 million people hmm. and the whole region the southern tamil nadu region would be maybe 30 million people 25 million people which is bigger than you know many countries which is bigger than portugal as an example and much bigger than a finland finland is a country okay this region itself is bigger in terms of population then take the state the state of tamil nadu is 80 million people mm. which is bigger than france in population bigger than italy bigger than uk in population of the us yes <laughs> and a third of the us right. or a quarter of the us and so clearly a lot more production is possible locally right and we have to aim for it that has to be a the goal of economic policy everywhere right but with our needs changing so dramatically and also you know i mean living in such an unpredictable world i mean if you were to say about a year back if you thought ppes were uh, something that we should have have locally produced i mean it yes. would not be the case uh, you know we've had to ramp up production on things to that effect uh so how do we balance some of these trade offs i mean uh you know as you rightly said we're living in this uh, quote and quote multi tenant world right so where where everything is distributed uh so do you also foresee you know that kind of supply chains like complicated supply chains as have come to be uh you know going further as well or do you see like a more more of a drive to localism in terms of okay i mean we are going to be self sufficient we're going to leverage all the knowledge that is available but maybe we will have our resources to build whatever we need yeah so i i actually would distinguish between self reliance versus self sufficiency hmm. self reliance is the capacity to produce something and self sufficiency is actually not relying on anybody else so you want the capacity to produce and the capacity to trade on equal terms the trading on equal terms is a very important idea it means that if we want to buy mri machines or smartphones we are able to produce not those same things but equal and complexity goods and services that's an important idea hmm. because when you don't have that and this is where i you know, i i divide this into three components there is balance balance in the crude level of what i buy and what i sell to have a economic balance otherwise i go into debt right if i buy a lot more than i sell and that's applicable to a the regional level and a state level and a country level it's true if we keep buying and don't sell we are going to go into debt that's balance the second is symmetry symmetry is an interesting notion where we want to have uh, trading on equal terms and that mm. means that complexity of what i am capable of should match the complexity of what i buy otherwise you will have this uh, for example the oil countries oil exporting countries 
mostly only export oil and import everything else. And then when oil prices crash, their economy is going to a tailspin. In fact, all of those countries, the, for example, the Middle Eastern countries are trying to diversify their economic base for this very reason. And diversifying means more symmetry, meaning the, we buy complicated goods and we have to be able to sell some complex goods. That's needed absolutely in India at a regional level, not only at a national level. It has to be true at a regional level as well. So this does not lead to self-sufficiency. It leads to self-reliance, which is a more important goal. Right. So on that same uh, note, sir, what is your opinion on the uh, Prime Minister's Atmanabhar uh, Bharat vision that was announced earlier this year? Uh, any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, this is actually, that is a self-reliance. Atmanabhar is really self-reliance expressed. And I fully support this idea. And this is actually extremely important. And the pandemic has given an impetus to it. And also various national security concerns have come to the fore now. So it's obvious to everyone, okay, regardless of their political ideology, whatever, that we do need a lot more local production. We do need self-reliance. And that's, those ideas are clear to corporate leaders, to politicians, to you know, all, of, all of us, it's really clear. And how do we make it happen? That, do, that is the challenge. Right. And that is where I keep emphasizing the importance of technology know-how, technology capabilities. Right. And do you see that uh, change happening on the ground? I mean, I am privy to talking to a lot of startup founders, so I may be extremely biased. In fact, just earlier today, I was talking to uh, the founder of uh, uh, Kaga Scanner. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. Uh, so, you know, Cam Scanner is a very popular app. Yeah. They got banned yeah. uh, in the end of June. And then these guys have seen uh, about a million plus uh, downloads happen and they're, they're riding that wave, right? They're doing fantastically well, smart kids as such. Uh, are you seeing that uh, change happen? Because this was a common lament even, I would say, five, ten years back, which is that, hey, I mean, India has a huge services base. We don't have uh, product capabilities. We don't have IP as such. Do you see that changing? Definitely it is changing. And, uh, and this has to go well beyond software. Definitely software is an important part. But we need know-how in, for example, textile making. Well, I'll give you this example. I have visited textile factories and... Um, and you see, for example, how cotton gets translated into the yarn. And, uh, the, the, and you'll see the production process of like eight steps or something. Mm -hmm. And you look at the machines, every single one of those machines, you will see uh, German, Swiss, yeah. Japanese. I think we make some of the machines, but, but still you will, most of the sophisticated machines, technology is important on these. There are robotic machines that do some, you know, uh, mind-blowing kind of things in this. I was I could see in the production line. The critical point is we actually don't have the production know-how. Mm. We set up factories, but the know-how is coming from abroad. The machines are coming from abroad. I mean, Switzerland and Germany and Japan, none of them grow cotton. Yet they have the best technology for converting cotton into the yeah, yeah. fabric, right? So that's that's crucial for us to to master the technology. And in fact, Switzerland makes the best rice polishing machines. And they don't, they don't grow rice and mostly they don't consume rice. Yeah, it's too cold. So we have to ask ourselves, why cannot we make excellent rice polishing machines? And this is actually goes to deeper subject I talk about. We, in India, business mostly has come to mean trading, traditionally. And, and trading companies set up factories, but with a lot of imported know-how. And we have to move beyond that and figure out how to, to acquire the know-how ourselves and how to improve the know-how. For example, in a textile factory, the next production process might be involved, you know, maybe nine steps or maybe it'll combine some steps. But who is figuring that out? We should be figuring that out. Hmm. But now we rely on you know, Germany and Switzerland and Japan to do the hard work for us, basically. That is what we need to acquire next. To go from a $2,500 GDP to $25,000 GDP, and that is what is developed today, to 10x GDP, we absolutely need that know-how. And we need to figure all this out. Right. Build our production capabilities, basically. Correct. Correct. Right. So, Correct. Uh, this also... Not just factories. Factories yeah. are important, but the know-how is equally important. Right. Right. So this also, you know, asks a very fundamental question of education and skill development, uh, right? And uh, you are famously, uh, I mean, you're, 
you, you know, your one of your tweets was, you know, you don't value degrees as much, right? Uh, or rather, degrees have uh, uh, have started to lose correlation with what a person knows and how useful the person is, right? Um, so, what are your thoughts? Some broad thoughts on education and uh, skill development. Yeah, well, India already produces what a million engineers or so per year, and yet all of the critical production know-how is coming from abroad. So. And, and, and it goes further. For example, about two years ago, I was in Sastra University in uh, Tanjavur, which is, uh, which is in the, heart, the rice producing heartland of Tamil Nadu, right? The rice granary. And this university has been there 30 plus years. It's actually a very good engineering uh, uh, school, engineering institution. With, uh, it has produced a lot of alumni that have gone on to great success in many companies. Yet, if you look at the region itself, there is hardly any industry. Hmm. If you go to Tanjavur district itself, there's hardly any industry. So in spite of the presence of a, a really good engineering institution for three decades now, we have not been able to come up with industry. And this is true in many, many places in India. So, and I actually said in my uh, in the address there that these universities have now become, even when they are very good and they're often good, very good and they become efficient vacuum cleaners of talent. You suck the talent and render it into you know, either Bangalore or Chennai or abroad, mm. right? And this actually is not helping the rural district. I mean, mm. you, you can visibly see in Tanjavur district the, the manifestation of rural distress in terms of jobs, primarily jobs, jobs, jobs. That's the primary problem. And I would say it is not just a factory problem, set of factories, it's also a know-how problem. That is what, because a good example, Mexico, thanks to NAFTA, has a lot of factories. In fact, Mexico is the production hub of much of the North American yeah. market. Yet Mexico does not have the know-how. And therefore, Mexico is actually still stuck in that whole uh, middle income or lower middle income trap, where Mexico still has to send its uh, people abroad for work when they have so many factories already. And the reason is they don't have that know-how, production know-how. So the value addition is not staying in Mexico and it's not getting invested back into Mexico. That is the key problem. Right. So how do you think you can get that process started? You know, because uh, uh, one of the key aspects of education in any developing country like India would be uh, livelihood, right? Um, uh, many people, you know, they, in fact, I, I would say a near 100% of the people would uh, look at education as a means to an end, right? Where you say that, okay, I, let me get an engineering degree. I have a shot at uh, you know, Correct. getting into one of the co companies and, you know, maybe I will learn, you know, three lakhs or four lakhs or whatever it is, and I can support my dreams, my support, my family and so on and so forth. Now, if you were to talk to this person about, let's say the joy of learning or building an ecosystem uh, in his village or in his town or whatever, uh, I don't think he or she would prioritize that over his own livelihood, right? So how what would you get this? Uh, how would you get this process started? I would say. Yeah. So the responsibility is not with a fresh graduate, the responsibility with people who already have some capital, people who are already have businesses, entrepreneurs, not just with a fresh graduate. So people who already have the means can invest in smaller scale production and acquiring the know-how. I mean, it doesn't actually be something that it's one thing that people don't realize often. Take the textile machine that I talked about, a critical step in that uh, whole textile factory. Take any one of those machines, uh, for example, a spooler or something, I saw these machines. The R&D on that machine is probably 50 engineers, 30 engineers, not definitely not even 100 engineers. Yeah. But it takes three, five years to be really good at it, maybe 10 years. So it's not about the number of engineers you have to put on it. It's the, it's the depth of expertise you have to gain on it. Okay. Right. And so, so many industrial houses in India can afford those 30 engineers, mm. actually. And we just have to both uh, you know, hire those engineers, inspire them to do this. And this kind of 30 engineer effort can be in a rural area. That's exactly what that I am intending to do right now, to build these R&D know-how creation engines in rural areas. It doesn't matter where it is because it's, it's not even, there is no, really what is required is broadband. Mm. And, and really good brains. That's really all the ingredients that are needed. And so coming to education here, yeah, coming back to that topic for a second, we actually still, I, 
don't view a college degree itself as education mm. to me it's really the capability to think critically capability to be self reliant citizens participate in full citizenship that is education to me so i i define it much more broadly for example to me what is education education is really i can think critically i can process complex information i can participate in citizenship that means i can participate in decisions that are made about our our village our town our district our state all of that that is education and that is what we need to and that there is another component which is of course actual skill development and in india we actually have not paid enough attention to skill development and we have also not paid enough attention to critical skills instead we are paying attention to degrees hmm. having that stamp that says i have a degree and that is actually the least useful component of education it's a, what is a by product to indicate that somebody has all these skills now has become the central purpose and that degree itself is the target of education how many people have degrees yes uh, and i don't find it any more useful that's why we don't actually rely on degrees at all in zoom right no it's the most obvious signal that someone is educated but it's not the most accurate uh, signal that someone anymore. is uh, it is not even an accurate signal anymore that's exactly. the problem right yeah. uh on that note would you want to talk about some of the work that you're uh, doing with zoho university uh, that's an example of you know uh, uh, alternate education per se right and uh, yeah. also your tweets on uh, you know uh, setting up a school for the kids in the village was extremely appreciated as well uh, maybe you could talk about those two things yeah so and these two are kind of linked right zoho university yeah. itself uh, was started as a Uh, as an answer to the question do we really need college and this was asked to be 16 15 16 years ago and do we really need college to to prepare people to a software career and we decided we'll try this and that has now done really well and we have uh, you know maybe approaching 1000 now mark in terms of number of employees who have come out of this program or are making a vital contribution to the company now in all areas now. not only software development but even in areas like sales everywhere that we are we have zoho university alumni working now and so that is that is that experiment itself as emboldened to try more extend it further into the chain deeper and for example what is the purpose of a school today the purpose of a school is to acquire that school leaving certificate In fact, that's actually the correct purpose now, right? That right. because schools, you know, how do schools measure themselves? If we have ninety-nine percent or hundred percent pass rate, and eight of our students got top ranks, that's the whole purpose of that. And that is what is now. In other words, uh, what is a useful byproduct of education has become the central purpose of education again. Mm. So, can we rethink this? How do we rethink this? And that's what we are trying to do here. this is very early so i actually won't like to claim that we have achieved anything big yet we have just started these things and very enthusiastic children and we have some faculty we have in the process of training and and bringing on board but we still have a lot long road ahead so i probably would be able to talk about it in depth in a year or two or three <laughs> after right. we try it and see what happens right and uh... you know what is your opinion on skill based uh, education right uh, uh, so let's say electrical works or um, yeah. you know uh, what was erstwhile uh, the job of uh, iti basically right uh, uh, so those kind of uh, you know like workshops and so on and so forth um, yeah. you know yeah. how important are they in the entire education ecosystem per se they are extremely important if you take advanced countries whether it is germany and even the us most people don't know this about the us the real backbone of the american education system higher education system is the community college mm. the community college is where everybody very cheap actually almost free practically free you can go take uh, automotive uh, engineering class you can take uh, electrical maintenance class you can take uh, you know solar technology class and all these for something like 20 dollars 30 dollars often even free Mm. and recently actually they are even there's a move to make it free entirely and these are like uh, maybe you know three times a week or four times a week they'll meet usually they even have evening classes so that you don't actually have to you can still work in a job during day and you can go attend the community college in the evening so this actually is a very crucial 
uh, uh, element of employment. And actually, maybe 40, 50 percent of the kids actually go to those right. kind of schools. Right. What we think of as the prestigious universities are a very small percentage of students. And likewise, Germany actually emphasizes the apprenticeship model. And in the US also, there is a there is a discussion of reviving these community colleges, revitalizing them so that a lot more people can go. Because even Americans realize getting a degree in English or sociology is not going to help the country at once. No. There are too many English majors, too many sociology majors, too many psychology majors anyway, or history majors. What we need are actual skills. And that is in India that the ITIs were supposed to serve that role, but they are kind of languished. Really, they are the, the kind of a forgotten children right now. Mm. We have to revive them. So our one goal is to provide that at the school level itself as an additional sort of, a, again, the afternoons will be dedicated to skill development. Right. And that will be a mandatory part of our education that morning sessions are for the you know, mathematics, writing, all of that. But afternoons would be skill development and both will be mandatory. That is one of the goals we are setting. And we, so by the time they come out of that at 17 or 18 year old, they actually have concrete skills to offer. And they would have also good reading, writing, arithmetic, scientific knowledge. And we will teach subjects like history or geography through documentaries. Mm. We, are not, we are not going to inflict them this uh, book learning and then they forget, right? So we'll show them a lot of documentaries. And we will, it has to be fun, okay? Yeah. Mathematics, of course, has to be drilled. We will drill mathematics. There's no uh, substitute for it. But things like history, we can teach through documentaries. And then the actual concrete skilling, skill development is mandatory. We will offer a maybe stream of eight or 10 and students can pick two or three that they are interested in. Right. So that is how we are thinking about education. And I also believe music should be a core component. This is an idea that uh, borrowed from Finland and uh, where music is a core component of their education through school. And I actually believe that that should be mandatory ahead as well. Right. Right. So uh, um, another uh, aspect of education as we see it today is the fact that it's one size fits all. Right. Uh, so whether uh, as a child or even as, uh, you know, someone as a developing uh, uh, teenager or whatever, uh, you are taught some seven or eight subjects irrespective of what your inkling is, right? Whether you, it's more towards the arts or more towards the uh, uh, scientific subjects, et cetera, et cetera. Do you believe that, you know, uh, is there a way to sort of help a child develop in the region he or she is interested in? Yeah. Definitely, that is part of the uh, goal here, where we will have these menu of choices, but we are not going to actually uh, uh, insist that every student take everything. Mm -hmm. That's important. Second, I also the, the the part of the education that is approximates what is today, maybe the book learning. We are going to keep that also uh, somewhat optional, depending on the subject. Not every child, everyone will be pushed into this. And some of them could also come back after, like say, I'm 20, I'm interested now in mathematics or history. That's okay. See, we have to actually remove this ageism in education. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. A lot of people get, uh, get interested in subjects later in life. Okay. I mean, I'm a good example. Actually, in, I never cared for computer science in, while I was in IIT. I completely avoided it. And I had no interest in programming. Actually, I had no interest in programming. That's the, the truth. I only got interested in it after maybe 25 or 26. Right. So I'm a late bloomer as far as programming is concerned. Actually, even though I had access to computers, I never showed any interest in it. Right. So that is an example where actually I think uh, you, you definitely need to keep the doors open. Right. The skill development as well as even conventional you know, mathematics or history, people should have... Somebody would be able to better appreciate history maybe at 30 or 35. Absolutely. And definitely not at 15. <laughs> so today it stops at 15. That's the problem. Right. No, and uh, uh, one of the things that always boggles my mind is something that we have accepted that, you know, 24, 25, the education stops, you know. Yes. Uh, and then after that, you live another 40 or 50 years of your life, uh, you know, managing with what you know, right. So, so that's the sort of a paradigm. Uh, that is bad and uh, so many of the things that I have learned, yeah. I have taught myself at an older age, right. not something that was taught in my conventional education itself. 
so absolutely sir i want to uh, you know move slightly towards what the government can do uh, for all of the things that uh, we discussed uh, up until now right uh, so if there are people in the government if there are policy makers that are listening to this uh, what are the kind of investments we should make uh, you know to to build the sort of vision that you're talking about yeah so i would emphasize bottom up uh, development not top down so i call it delhi driven development is a top down development versus bottom up village driven development and this is of course mahatma gandhi's vision and uh, and that is absolutely still valid for india because it's a, it's a universal principle i mean that we can do better when people are closer to development so that is actually important that uh, bottom up development is important and so i would say empower the rural areas empower the small towns empower the cities mm. and set up governance that is stronger at those levels and make sure that the feedback loops are in place and uh, that means that what is happening in the ground level the decision makers have to have accurate feedback loops and today that is actually often missing but people don't have that the, the, we don't policy makers don't get enough feedback often so that is important and i'll give you one example of a kind of reform that i would suggest today if you look at our ias which is a you know strong administrative uh, uh, foundation for india the district collector job is the is kind of the lower in the totem pole while uh, chennai or delhi jobs are much more prestigious correct in this i want to reverse it. the district collector job should be the more prestigious job where but that's where the action is that's where the rubber meets the road yeah that's where real administration has to happen right the higher level set policy but the, this is where the implementation execution is happening and so we need smart people and we also need tenure see the the one problem is the stick collectors change every couple of years and that's not actually conducive for learning about the area its problems and how to solve it what is needed all of those before somebody actually has already le- has properly learned all this we change them and, and so it's the complicated problems remain and the next person has to start all over so even with the best of intentions this this is not a good system so we need administrative reforms where smart people stay in a particular job for a duration to make a difference this is exactly what we do in companies like zoho we actually when we have a zoho product the stay a duration to the job done we don't change the course every year every year or every two years that's that, that's not a good way to produce these products in fact i mentioned the r&d problem this is a critical insight about r&d and skill or or know how development that people have to stay on that problem mm. we have to invent this uh, 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 robotic spooling machine for textiles well i need a commitment of 5 to 10 years to make that machine to put figure that out right. yeah, then if that is true for machines it's even more true for a district <laughs> that people have got the know how I mean, it's a lot more complex problem yet we shift decision makers every two years that's the problem right no the innovation cycles are are, are longer i suppose right i mean even yes. if you look at just com- contrast uh, software with hardware the reason why you have fewer hardware startups is it's it's harder to go to market harder to get, uh, uh, complete that iteration as such right iteration and learn um right so so in actual terms in uh, in terms of your prescription per se right uh, how would you how would you induce this sort of federalism i mean would you say that you know the uh, the central government allocates funds and uh, you know uh, how would you go about it yeah i i don't believe this is a uh... tax policy or incentives or any of those mm. it's really role models examples mm. and it is also the, the the leadership by example where you know these administrative reforms where districts are important that job is important villages are important and reforms where rural empowerment and rural amenities a lot of those will make a difference basics you know i i don't really think that the government itself can produce the know how in this but it can actually spur a movement as an example one concrete thing i have suggested already before that there is a sort of a, a, a national technology office or a know how office which simply evaluates where we stand in each of the 100 or 200 or 300 critical sectors and evaluates indian companies against the best of the world hmm. and ask questions in semiconductor equipment where are we 
in semiconductor fabs where are we in smartphones or in uh, cpus where are we in video conferencing where are we and rank the companies and just like what has been done recently for the video conferencing type of thing but do it across 200 300 the the government should be a tough taskmaster mm. it's like a good school teacher holding students to account saying <coughs> the industry to account why are we not the best mm. why are we lagging behind fast is publish the rankings publish against the best of the world and maybe give awards those are the kinds of things that will spur the, the energy okay right. and i don't think it is it, this does not require a 50000 crore budget allocation maybe a 500 crore can actually do magic here but what is important is that that the whole spur that this has to become part of the national conversation right right this has to be you know talked up by the the decision makers policy makers and frequently we have these competitions we announce who are who is winning like you know this spurs the innovation it spurs companies including companies like us for example if you are asked how does zoho mail start up against gmail how does zoho office suite start up against microsoft office let the government do a tough evaluation of these and publish mm-hmm. results that will give us spur to our engineers and it should do it across 200 300 500 critical sectors that is what i would suggest right okay so let's move to business and entrepreneurship um, i i really really loved your thread on uh, uh, you know how modern management uh, theory is is bs essentially right uh, yeah. you view the business as being an organic entity right and that it's part of a community it can't uh, right. the end aim of a business cannot be just maximizing shareholder value uh because that is something that we have learned from covid as well right with all of the right. uh things that uh, you know the us companies outsourced uh, it's a remarkable thing that they did not have capacity to produce ppes right, right. For, for even though them being the the most developed nation in the world today right, right. uh so you want to talk about that uh, sir i mean the the responsibility of a business towards a community and not just simply maximizing shareholder value yeah i look at the purpose of business as capital development and i mean capital in a very broad sense of the term there is community capital there is of course the human capital of our knowledge know how skills all of that there is cultural capital and there is ultimately a civilizational capital for example i i am here in this village and it has to be harmonious place for me to live mm. if there is conflict if there is social conflict if there is hunger there is poverty there is disease then i am not my own well being is affected right so and that is a form of capital and my business has a responsibility to nurture all these forms of capital it's not merely that or oh, the government will take care because the government cannot be there in every single place every single village it's not possible every single neighborhood every single uh, ward in a city it's not possible so that means that the local business has a vital role to play in the holistic cap- capital development and capital here includes i mean knowledge capital cultural capital community capital all of those the institutional cultural all of those elements because all of that go into making us civilized and developed okay because what makes a switzerland pleasant mm. and this is what it is it's all of those elements and the businesses have played a vital role in this it's not merely that top down government decreed all this or willed it into place it is businesses that built it up same thing in germany and same thing in the us too originally right for example the us the public library system was created by uh, a businessman originally right and that is that's a form of capital that was created so ultimately that is how i see business holistically and today what what has happened is wall street in a reductionist ultimate reductionist way mm-hmm. reduced that capital to its financial value in other words all of this capital is summarized by one metric called valuation mm-hmm. and you keep boosting valuation that's actually a stupid idea in fact the stupid idea was pr- propounded by a nobel laureate as often happens in economics milton friedman who is actually a genius i admire came up with the stupid idea that all forms of capital is captured in the shareholder value i totally fundamentally disagree with it and i would challenge milton friedman to a debate if he were alive unfortunately he's dead but i think actually would, uh... concept, i think that is the problem right no no i i think he would have slightly different views given the world we are living uh, in uh, today True. especially right True. So I I actually always liked Milton Friedman but this yeah. is something I fundamentally disagree with him on. Right. 
right no that's a very interesting point that you bring up right the the whole friedman view of you know free markets will solve everything in the world for us uh, that has its limitations right and irrespective of what uh, sphere you belong to right left center it doesn't matter it's easy to recognize there some things you have to um uh, i mean you have uh, the government has to step in and invest in some of these things maybe uh, individuals have to take up uh, some some of these things and markets will solve something else right uh, one of the yeah. examples that you spoken about is uh, uh, the taiwan example for example right uh, and that's not necessarily due to any government policies or whatever the semiconductor industry or uh, you know the growth there uh, do you want to, do you see something similar happening here as well where you know people rise up to the occasion maybe you know we will start becoming an industry hub per se uh, uh, going forward for for any particular thing yeah so you take that taiwan semiconductor revolution it really traces its roots to mr boris chak the founder of tsmc the taiwan semiconductor manufacturing corporation which is now the most advanced fabs in the world okay they recently overtook about a couple of years ago they overtook intel in terms of their the technological advancement advancement of their fabs but they still retain the lead and this is all due to his perseverance and persistence we need that in india we need similar thinking in india that we have to take a technology electric cars fabs dc motors or mri machines we have to say we are going to be the world's best in this absolutely we are going to compete with the best and this is and and it may take several years okay and i often admit in zoho we still have work to do this is what i every day i talk to our engineers about we have to do this better why are we behind in this area and that feedback loop that constant push prodding us ourselves you know we know this how we know how to do this we are doing this with our kids in school which is actually the wrong place to do it that is i don't believe that kids should be pushed so much about exam preparation test preparation and exams but industry should push itself to excel hmm. to be the best in the world and that actually once we start doing that you will see that magically things start to happen i am actually an optimist we have the capacity to do this india will do it can do it and will do it but it's it's a matter of the resolve and the resolve is not just about the government resolve it has to be in the private sector it has to be with the entrepreneurs right you have to ask yourself why don't we have this technology why can't we build it what does it take let's go figure it out that is the that is what i'm trying to spread spread this idea that we can do it right so and i'm coming to market and where versus this this issue of market industrial policy the market system itself exists in a fabric of for example law and order cultural institutional exactly. capital code exactly. all of that right. so the market cannot exist without all of those things existing right yes the society has to come to exist for a market mechanism to work right no the the point that you know i mean uh, people uh, participate compete uh, with full cognizant of the rules itself is yeah. a is a subject of uh, culture right is a subject of people's own uh, discretions that they that they choose to participate in the market so market is not thrust upon uh, uh, as i would say right right uh, well, i did even take the notion of private property hmm. there is a social component there where if i own some property if a community doesn't accept my ownership then i really don't own it yes <laughs> if broadly people don't respect it ownership mm-hmm. then it's not own so and that respecting the ownership means that there is already a cultural institutional uh, capital at work that exactly. was built up in order to respect people's ownership so that is important that that's a essentially that's a that's a core part of how markets come to exist private right. property comes to exist right no on a on a side note i feel you know uh, a lot of uh, law and order also is very cultural at this point of time it's yes. not like you know we exactly. have the resources capacity to uh, put someone with a you know danda or a gun at every place to police us right uh, uh, look actually, at the number of villages actually i want to point out yeah uh, mr gurumurthy uh, yeah precisely as uh, often pointed out yeah india has about 20000 police stations for 6 lakh villages 7 lakh villages yeah so there is one 7 lakh villages so there's actually one police station for 30 plus <laughs> villages and i visibly see it yeah the police station is actually not nearby and you probably get to see a policeman once in 6 months or once a year yeah actually right. so and people maintain the peace that is cultural capital that is yeah. civilizational capital that's very important so. right right so uh, let me come back to the point on entrepreneurship so what is your let's say three step 
formula or prescription to create let's say another 100 zohos how do how do we create another 100 zohos in the next 5 10 years i i you know again this is the thing where i don't know that i would say 100 zohos as the thing because i i think it's better to say 100 unique entities that are foundations of their communities that's right. how i'll put it right because again we this is not some there is a zoho factory somewhere where you can churn out zohos right <laughs> each of them has to be built right. by somebody committed Right. and when they built it build it it will come out their own unique way hmm. so you are not going to have 100 zohos but you are going to have 100 companies 100 institutions that are foundations of their communities hmm. that's what we need and that can be done and they will all have individual variations look we are a pluralistic society and not everyone will agree with each other that's hmm. important and these disagreements are essential and that's part of our cultural ethos too this hmm. debates and disagreements is very much core part of india all along Absolutely. So we are not going to have hundred exact clones of Zoho. We are going to have hundred strong companies. In fact, we need more than hundred. We need maybe ten thousand for India scale. Right. No, sharing the ethos basically, sharing the same right. e- similar ethos exactly. of uh, developing, uh, you know, in India for India per se, right? Correct. Uh, so okay, let's uh, take a final step back and look at some of the qualitative, quantitative uh, markers of progress uh, for a nation. You know. um uh, you are often uh, uh, what do you say i mean you you're not a fan of gdp growth and those kind of economics uh, uh, markers as such right uh, so what would you say how would you say india has developed yeah. let's say 5 years so, down the line or 10 years down the line if you were to say that yeah. you know what today we are a developed nation what are those yeah. markers that you would uh, cite yeah so first uh, come to gdp GDP is a useful notion. We just don't want to overemphasize one thing to the exclusion of others. Mm. For example, China is obsessively focused on GDP, so they produce GDP all right, mm. but at an extraordinary cost to their environment, to the debt levels, and uh, dislocating people from the countryside to forcibly, you know, moving them. All of these things, which I don't think GDP is worth acquiring at that price, at that mass, massive price that they have paid as a society. so while gdp is useful i would not overemphasize it and what are the markers we see everything from for example this law and order are we keeping the peace ourselves without overlaying on a on extreme police persons that is a good marker and do we have uh, harmonious relations do we have capital development proceeding that means that new companies emerging new technologies coming up our capabilities are going up that is actually easy to and again this is where i mentioned the government can actually publish a score card of this mm. of across industrial processes where do we stand do we have the know how in medicine do we have the know how in uh, uh, for example the new kind of vaccines or new kind of uh, uh, the bio- biotech medicines so those are all capabilities we have to acquire and this is where the government can spur the innovation cycle on that is how i would track our progress and for example things like gross enrollment ratio in higher education i don't really worry about that metric because we can enroll everybody in and hand everybody a degree that's not going to solve our problem i mean handing everybody a degree is actually equal to adding a couple of zeros to our rupee note hmm. it has the same effect <laughs> doesn't mean anything right so right. that is why i say that it's not useful but what we really need is those capabilities real capabilities right. being built up right Yeah, it's easier to spend your way to increasing your GDP in that sense. I mean, if you were to look Correct. at it, right? So, right. Um, so we're operating in exceptional times. Uh, you know, we've been under the grips of a pandemic for the better part of this year. Uh, in fact, I think we, you know we're we're closing in on the rest of this year as well, right? So, uh, how do you see us uh, positioned to come out of uh, COVID stronger? Specifically, what are those uh, you know key trends uh, uh, that favor our progress? Uh, you know, coming out of this uh, pandemic. Yeah, in India itself, I see that particularly rural India, smaller towns everywhere, effectively nobody pays attention to these things anymore. So people are out and about, and whatever the government advisor is, on the ground people are not paying attention to this. I can see, you can visibly see it anywhere around. But with that, the case load is not exploding, and it's not there's not a distress. in rural areas in terms of death rate all of that still it is a dangerous virus but at least from what you see on the ground not you know there is it's not so dangerous that a lot of people are impacted that's the truth 
which means that effectively a lot of business and other things are returning on the ground mm. everything from a tea shop to the 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 auto rickshaws all of them are running now just normal the buses are running here only the trains are not running yet fully so i think they will all return over time and uh, in my opinion maybe the worst has passed like even the case count in india the 90000 is hovering around 80000 70000 but it's not further exploding it's not going to 200000 i actually had calculated that it might reach about 150 200000 before coming down but it appears to be coming down even before that that about 90 85000 so while by no means it's over i would also maybe I'll say tentatively that the worst impact may be behind us right it's still going to affect us at uh, some level definitely but maybe the worst impact is over as a country and from here on it does look more i, I do feel more optimistic but we still have the pre existing problem pre pandemic pre covid like nps pervasive debt pervasive dollarized debt which i have talked about in my uh, tweets all of those issues have to be addressed and we have to we definitely have to get more self reliant in the doha so those so now we can get to focus on those problems do you sometimes worry about like the over financialization of the economy i mean of course i mean we are somewhere behind but do you, is that a fear as we get more definitely i fear that because i definitely that is a fear because finance is a very attractive drug yeah so it's, it's a drug that uh, addicts us and every country that has gone down that path has come to regret it okay because debt is a drug on the way up it, it gives you a high and then it crashes you down on the way down so unfortunately it is very tempting to take the drug all around and uh, and i am i am i really hope that we don't actually get uh, uh, hooked on to this hooked on to this and that requires some resolve on the way on the on our policy makers uh, Uh, side so that we don't actually get hooked, and we have role models now. I mean, the U.S. economy, which is hyper financialized, a lot of the social conflict is directly coming from this finance-driven inequality. So we we cannot really afford that in India, that kind of inequality. So, right. Uh, all right. So this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, my final uh, question to you, although there is many things that uh, you know the youth can take away from uh, everything that you've spoken over the last hour, uh, you know, what would be your advice to someone at this point of time? Let's say I'm a young person. What are some three things that I should do going forward that can be uh, you know beneficial to me, to my community, and to the nation at large? Yeah. First, I would encourage every young person to. to acquire some skill knowledge know how that they are good at and and don't be influenced by what other people are good at decide what you can be good at okay that's important i have a I have a clear eyed view of that and be good at it okay because if you are very good at something you have no trouble making it generally you don't notice that is that's a good thing first first thing second having done that once you have a, a reasonably secure foundation for yourself and your family then broaden your reach and try to help out at least one person all i'll say is one person okay you know don't don't try to save india try to save one person <laughs> be you know be a mentor be a coach all of that okay. and that's after having helping yourself right first first wear your <laughs> mask and then help others to wear the mask that idea then third i would say this is actually important too longer term i want as we people get older we have to take active part in public affairs public life mm. politics is not to be reserved for politicians alone mm. we all all of us citizens in a democracy have a stake in the system literally we vote our government self so we have to take part in it we have to participate in debates educate yourself be active participants in how we are going so those are the three things i would say right wonderful uh, note to end the podcast on uh, shikhar yeah. sir uh thank you so much uh, i think our audience will appreciate this immensely before we leave you can we get one photo for uh, social media sure <laughs> right so i'm just going to take a screenshot all right smile sir thank you thank you i'll just get one more just in case all right yeah Thank you so much sir this was uh, a wonderful experience thank you so much sir
Thank you for tuning in. This podcast uh, was brought to you by the team at Bharat Vartha. If you liked this podcast, then don't forget to share, subscribe and rate us on your favorite platforms. Uh, we're available on Anchor, Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, Breaker, YouTube and a host of other platforms. Uh, we started Bharat Vartha to facilitate long form discussions on uh, politics, policy and culture. We don't necessarily endorse anything that was said in this episode. Uh, if you do wish to offer us any feedback on the content or anything else, uh, do reach out to us on social media or get in touch with us uh, on our website, www.bharatvartha.in. Uh, the links are in the description below. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, stay safe, take care and Jai Hind.